Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the FCC and an editor at Bloomberg News based here in Hong Kong. And before, uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yan and his topic. I am going to tell you about a few upcoming events. Um, we will have on uh, the uh, 8th of October, in another less than a week, a club screening, Tell Them Who You Are, a documentary on Haskell Wexler in Burt's. Uh, we have on the, also that same evening, we have the Sichuan Gala Dinner. On the 9th of October, we have the Champagne Social. And on the uh, 22nd of October, we have another club lunch, David Shambaugh, who is a professor at George Washington University in Washington, DC, um, will speak on further challenges for China's role in the world. So sign up for the events. Um, I wanted now to introduce our speaker who will be talking to us about reflections on China's transformation, the People's Republic at 70, a timely topic. And our speaker was uh, in Beijing the other day for the celebrations, so he may have some thoughts on what he saw there as well. Our speaker is Professor Yan Shoujun, who's an associate professor in politics and public administration at HKU. Uh, he's going to talk to us about how to make sense of the multiple faces of the Chinese body politic today, especially under the leadership of Xi Jinping, how the Chinese nation state will sustain and reform amid the global surge of anti-China sentiment, and what is the essence of the one country, two systems policy, and in what way is it relevant to China's future? So timely topics all. And Professor Yan is an associate professor in politics and public administration at University of Hong Kong. And he's also the director of the Research Hub on Institutions in Ch of China. He has a bachelor's degree and master's from Peking University and degrees, including one in political si a PhD in political science from Harvard University. And he is a Boston Red Sox fan. <laughs> I got that out of him. <laughs> Join me in welcoming Professor Yan. Madam President, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here to this um, uh, luncheon and thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, it's my great honor to be here today joining uh, so many renowned journalists, writers and friends to reflect on the 70 years of my country, the People's Republic of China, and to discuss about its past, present and future. Uh, this very club, the Foreign Correspondence Club, actually has a longer history than, uh, the P and than that of the PRC. Uh, it, it was funded, this club was funded in 1943 in the wartime Chongqing. Uh, during that war, uh, we Chinese fought with uh, the American, British, French, Russian, and so many, uh, uh, and people from so many other countries of the world. Um, arm in arm against a small group of militant regimes who wanted to sh change the world by force and even to in eliminate other people who they think are inferior, uncivilized, dirty, or morally corrupted. They wanted to play God and dominate the world by military might. They failed and we won. Uh, the world order we are enjoying today is uh, one of the major achievements of that war. Uh, that very moment of victory, in my view, is the birthday of modern China. And also is the birthday of the modern Chinese body politic we see today. The Chinese, the Chinese people do cherish this moment of victory because this is the first time since the Opium War that China is treated as an equal member of, um, uh, to the West um, in the global affairs. And since then, China and Chinese people have strived to become a responsible member who can make contributions to this fine global family. As Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the, uh, the founding father of modern China said on his deathbed, 
uh, we Chinese must unite with all the nations in the world who are willing to treat us equally. So when we are about to reflect upon the past 70 years of my country, uh, I think this should be the starting point, uh, to be treated equally and be treated as an equal member uh, in the global community. This humble goal is what the Chinese people are struggling for not only in the past 70 years, but in the past one and a half century since China's humiliating defeat in the Opium War. In my view, this is the essence of the China dream, as well as the um, essence of the so-called national rejuvenation. So when we, are, uh, when we are reflecting upon China's 70 years, uh, we need to first probably look into the symbolism of uh, 70. Um, what does 70 mean in the Chinese context? Uh, as uh, Madam President mentioned just now, I uh, returned to Hong Kong last night from the National Day celebration uh, in Beijing. Um, I attended uh, the d d different activities in the Great Hall of the People and also on Tiananmen Square. Uh, on October the 1st, actually my seat on the square, on Tiananmen Square, is just a few steps from the gate of heavenly peace, where Mao Zedong announced the founding of the central people's government uh, of, the, of China in 1949. And also, uh, tragedy happened there in 1989. Today, all the banners on October 1st this year, all the banners and costumes and souvenirs are marked by a big number 70. Um, so 70. And um, uh, from my observation, I can see the tone of the state celebration there is one that is mixed by pride, uh, reflection, retrospection, as well as a kind of uh, pleasant emotion that you can only find in someone who has just crossed a critical threshold or who has just narrowly escaped from a grave danger. Why is that? In my view, I think this is natural. 70 is a number that has profound symbolism that might be prophetic in many ways. Politically, I think the biggest uh, memory, historical memory, historical lesson for the Communist Party and for President Xi Jinping is the, so uh, is the Soviet Union. You can see on the slide. Uh, we know that uh, the Soviet Union lasted for 69, uh, 69 years and it had, never, it had never made to 70. The complete failure of the Soviet Communist Party has long been the most important political lesson for her Chinese younger brother now the largest ruling communist party in the world. President Xi Jinping, even in his very early years in power, has warned the whole party about the danger of a Soviet-style overnight collapse. He said a big party was gone just like that. Um, proportionally, the Soviet Communist Party had more numbers than we do, as she said. But nobody, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist when the final moment comes. For the Chinese Communist Party, 70 is a symbol of a possible long rule over China, and it's perhaps also a sign that it has just crossed the threshold uh, uh, um, of avoiding uh, a, a Soviet-style failure. Historically, 70 is also um, Historically, 70 is also a very critical number for China because 70 is the average length of the, uh, of the dynasties, Chinese dynasties in history. Professor Wang Yuhua of Harvard University analyzed the database uh, which contains numbers of the rule of Chinese dynasties. There are 49 dynasties in Chinese history. And um, there's many different uh, observations of pro uh, pro Professor Wang, but one of the most important observations from uh, analyzing the database, he said, is that no dynasty can rule forever. 
He said the 49 dynasties lasted for an av average of 70 years. Well, a wide ranging variation from the Hengchu, which lasted for only one year, to uh, the Tang Dynasty, which lasted uh, for 289 years, but in average is only 70 years, the length of uh, dynasties. And Professor Wang said, assuming that the Chinese Communist Party is still in power in 2019, which it, it, it is, it will reach the 70 year average. And also morally, it's a more op optimistic view is from Confucius. Confucius argues that at the age of 70, external norms and external rules are to be internalized into a person's moral core. This means that the external order has become a natural part uh, of the person. When norms become habitual, freedom is ensured. In a way, 70 is the age when you actually enjoy yourself. That's what Confucius might mean. The master said, at 15, my heart was set on learning. At 30, I stood firm. At 40, I had no more doubts. At 50, I knew the will of heaven. At 60, my ear was obedient. At 70, I, I could follow my heart's desire without overstepping the boundaries of what was right. If according to Western saying that 60 is the new 40, the symbolism of 70 is rather a mixed one with often contradictory connotations and implications or even prophetic metaphors. When China celebrates the 70th anniversary of her national day, there is a sense of relief. But looking into the future, the danger is always, always looming in the background. This is well recognized by the top leadership of the ruling Communist Party of China. As we know, every year, the top leader of China um, will address it, his senior subordinates at the Central Party School. This year, President Xi Jinping decided to talk about how to manage risks. In January this year, President Xi Jinping addressed a special, uh, addressed a special workshop of senior uh, officials on how to properly manage risks, saying that the party should be on high alert about black swine and also uh, gray rhino event, uh, events. On September the 3rd, the president again uh, addressed to a different workshop comprised of younger uh, generation of communist officials at the Central Party School. This time, he called on officials, particularly young officials of the Communist Party, to maintain a fighting spirit and to strengthen their ability to struggle, doujin. Uh, when facing co concentrated risks, he said that the younger generation of the Chinese Communist Party must stick to the fighting spirit of the party, the revolutionary tradition, as well as the strategic uh, know-how about managing risks and uh, uh, responding to social demands. At age of 70, while well, the PRC is primarily dealing with its own problems, um, China, under the leadership of the, P, uh, of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is also surprisingly seen by many people as a danger in itself and a threat to the integrity of the Western model of development and democracy, or even a threat to the universal value that had been developed by uh, humankind uh, since the French Revolution. Some even see this as a clash of civilization. In May 2019, this, in May this year, the Washington Examiner reported that the State Department's policy uh, planning uh, director, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Skinner, said that uh, the United States is preparing for a clash of civilizations with China. And she said that um, the, uh, China poses a unique challenge because the regime in Beijing isn't a child of Western philosophy and history. 
He said the, she said the Cold War constituted a fight within the Western family, while the coming conflict with China is the first time that we will have a great power competitor that is not Caucasian. The Chinese body politic is a mystery, um, a puzzle, a question for an answer. Different people have different conceptions of the Chinese body politic. Dr. Skinner, the director of policy, the former director of uh, uh, policy planning because she was forced out, out of job in August, um, she sees the validity of the, uh, of the alternative form of the yellow peril discourse, which took place um, like 100 years ago. But for other people, the Chinese state has a totally different view, uh, image and views. As we can see that um, the sort of underground church is an illegal underground church defined by the Chinese state. It's called the Eastern Lightning. They have a metaphor. Is they see um, the Chinese state as the evil great red dragon. And some see that uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, yellow peril discourse. Some see that China is a sort of a defender of an authoritar authoritarian form of, uh, of politics, the control of information, the control of flow of uh, people, and um, all kinds of social control measures. And uh, some of uh, the people will define this uh, digital authoritarianism or surveillance authoritarianism. Some see China as a sort of, uh, sort of a, a challenger, not only to the existing international order, but also to the power status of the United States. So to understand the um, multiple faces of the Chinese body politic today, uh, I think we need to first see what China had experienced in the past 70 years. The Chinese body, po body politic is not a fixed one. It actually is always in transformation. So in my uh, view, transformation should be the central theme when we look into the Chinese body politic at 70. So what did China go through in the past century? I think there are several important transformations. First of all, in the past 70 years, um, the chi China has transformed itself from the poorest economy to the second largest economy in the world. When the Foreign Correspondents Club moved to Hong Kong from Chongqing in June 1949, China was a very poor, is probably the poorest country um, in the world and uh, torn apart by uh, uh, foreign wars and also civil wars. But today, China has become the uh, sort of leader in the global economic scene. But, most but more importantly is the living standard of the Chinese people had uh, raised to a new level. In 1949, probably even in 1978, no one in China had a sort of private car, or very few people have it. But in today, when we are in the um, uh, traffic jam of Beijing, we just complain that there are too many cars in China, just too much, too many cars in Beijing. And in the past 70 years, China has transformed itself from the central planning economy, a Soviet-style economy, to a market economy. Uh, this is a new challenge as well to politics, the body politic because under the central planning system, the party state has a lot of ways to control all the resources in the, world, uh, in, in, in the country, and also it has uh, maintained a very strong control over the society and uh, people because of its monopoly over economic resources. But with, uh, with the transition to a market economy, the uh, party state basically is losing its uh, pre previously available means of governance. It has to uh, find new ways of uh, sort of, uh, of rule. And also, I think a very important uh, uh, change and transformation in the past 70 years is uh, China's transformation from a traditional society to a modern society. But this is an ongoing transformation. From what's going on in Hong Kong, we can see that the Chinese Communist Party is still learning how to manage a metropolitan city and how to manage a multicultural uh, sort of culture. 
from a traditional society to a modern society will necessarily mean that uh, the rising demands of the citizenry or the citizens of China for greater uh, freedoms on all fronts and also people wanting more control of their own lives. And that is sort of uh, something the Communist Party is trying to learn. There are other sort of important transformations as, as well. In the past 70 years, uh, the Chinese Communist Party itself has transformed itself from a revolutionary state to a gradually normalized authoritarian state. Internationally, China has transformed from a once marginalized member of the global community, the victim of Western colonialism and invasion to an increasingly important power on the international stage. So when we are talking about all the transformation, uh, all kinds of transformation taking place in the past 70 years, my point here is that when we um, when we are reflecting on the body politic of uh, China, we need to see this as a going on process. It's a, transfer, it's, a, it's a process of transformation. It's also a process of trial and error. In a book I published in 2017 in China, I call this kind of process or the party state in this transformation stage as a learning regime. In my view, I think the central task for the Chinese Communist Party in this past 70 years and also in the years to come is to learn how to govern a modern society and a society in transformation. And why China is uh, relatively stable today, I think it depends on the Communist Party's capacity of learning. How could the party learn uh, from new things and from different materials that are made available to them? I think the, Hong, the, scene, the protest scene in Hong Kong today is a very good material for the Communist Party to learn, and they are learning, I think, uh, attentively. So in this transformation process, in my view, the Chinese body politic has at least three phases. Economically, I think the Chinese state is trying to make itself as the miracle maker. And this is the first phase of uh, the Chinese state. Since uh, my time is limited, so I would just uh, say that uh, in the past uh, 40 years of reform and open up, probably we can trace it back to 1949, that the Chinese party state has persistently played as a statist planner, uh, implementer, and regulator of the national economy. But also, the uh, state is trying very hard to adapt to the new economy, um, internet-based uh, uh, economy, knowledge economy, AI, and all kinds of innovative economy the, 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 the party states are trying to adapt itself to this new change. But as a, the miracle maker, the most important questions and challenges to the party state today uh, are two questions. One is how to balance market force and state regulation. The other question is how to balance state-owned enterprises or state economy uh, and the private sector. So which should play what part? I think this is the two most important study questions, homework for the Chinese Communist Party to study, and they're studying very hard. That's as far as I know. The second phase of the Chinese party state at, this, at 70, I think, is the political phase. The political phase, I think, is uh, 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 the Chinese party state is uh, playing a, a benevolent father or a benevolent sort of uh, a maintainer as a, a enforcer of rules. The politics in the PRC today is a transitional system that is featured by centralized political power. And for the party state today, the most important concerns for them, I think there are four concerns. One is how to maintain leadership stability. Uh, for the top leaders, this is the, one of the most important challenge, challenges to the party's rule over China, how to have a stable leadership. The second thing is how to maintain a peaceful po political order. And the situation in Hong Kong reminds them again about the danger of a sudden turn 
of uh, the overall tone of political order, and they're uh, a sort of uh, um, they uh, um, they take a lot of preventive measures to avoid the spread of uh, the political disorder from Hong Kong uh, uh, into the mainland. And also, the uh, third question or third concern about politics is how could the Chinese political system play a supporting role, a positive role, to economic development. And the last concern is how to meet the social demand for higher level of participation. And this is what uh, they do a lot of ex experiments in the past 40 years. And uh, I think the third phase of the political, uh, of the uh, body politic of China today is uh, a learn, uh, a, a sort of a, a student who is trying to learn how to manage the society and uh, increasingly uh, complex culture. In the past 40 years, we can see that the, Com the Communist Party of China has transfor transformed itself from a control for, uh, from a tight control of the cultural landscape of China into a hesita hesi hesitating builder and a manager of a plural society. The party learns to work with a gradually autonomous civil society, but also the party fears of disorder. The party in, uh, um, recognizes the increasingly modernized and diversified social interests, multiple cultures, and social minorities, minority groups in the society, but they are lack of modern policy instruments to meet the new requirements, new demands of these sort of new social and cultural groups. Sometimes the party state also shows a face of a heavy-handed uh, enforcer of rules and laws, uh, but also while suppressing uh, social pr pr protests occasionally at the grassroots, they're also trying very hard to find a way out that uh, can solve, they want to find a new way out that they can solve social disagreements and uh, solve social conflicts without using force. I think they're trying uh, that in Hong Kong now. So basically, in the political side, the party state, is, is, uh, the, the behavior of the party state, in my view, is learning by doing. So they learn from different sources, different materials, from different things, but they're also doing a lot of things to change, reform, improve, but also wanted to maintain the basic social order and, of course, the, uh, the rule of the Communist Party or the power status of the Communist Party. So now we need to see that uh, the three phases of the Chinese body politic we just talked about. Uh, but the most important thing as a communist state, as we uh, define it, uh, these kind of phases of the party state have to be supported by discourses. So a discursive framework is so important for the Communist Party to justify its uh, sort of uh, rule and to uh, gain legitimacy of its rule. There are four basically discourses in my view. The first one is uh, in Chinese, luohou jiao ai da, lagging behind leaves one vulnerable to attacks. So this is a firm belief of the Communist Party that uh, from its learning of the Chinese history from the Opium War. So that also leads to the Communist Party's strong belief in economic development, because only, to, only by building up a very strong economy, uh, uh, China can avoid a future uh, 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 invasion of a foreign uh, enemy. I think the second discourse uh, of uh, the Chinese Communist Party is that uh, uh, from the learning of the 150 years of Chinese modern history, the Communist Party realized that uh, the Chinese people in, uh, uh, before the PRC are just like a heap of loose sand, or China is in a state of uh, disunity, yipan san sha. Without a strong central uh, government, with, with, without a strong political leadership, China uh, cannot achieve anything. So this is one of the most important part of the official discursive framework. And this uh, is uh, the danger of the state of disunity is, uh, is uh, one of the major bases to justify the Communist Party's uh, uh, concentration of power in its own hands. And also, 
Related to this is a discourse on stability. Uh, the Communist Party uh, believes in stability. Without stability, you cannot do anything. You cannot uh, have economic development. You cannot have uh, effective governance. You cannot have uh, foreign relations. And the third discourse, in my view, is the peaceful development. Um, China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party actually is very willing to devote itself totally to domestic issues. It's not a very interesting participant in global, in being a global policeman. So uh, peaceful development is something uh, within the party's official discourse that once uh, the party uh, uh, has done very good jobs in managing the domestic politics and the economy and society, it has already made a very important contribution to the peace of the world. So it does not necessarily uh, have to involve itself into global affairs. Rather, uh, China's involvement in the global affairs are all oriented towards domestic economic development. So the priority, the order of priority is so important uh, in this discursive framework. Last but not, uh, last but not least is uh, the famous saying by the late Deng Xiaoping, uh, seeking truth from facts. That shows uh, the basic philosophy of the Chinese Communist Party. It's a very pra pragmatic, uh, realistic approach uh, and the philosophy of a ruling party. The party is totally non-ideological. -ide of course, it will pay, uh, it will have ide ideological campaigns, but the basic ideological line seeking to choose from the facts is, um, is uh, considered by the Communist Party as uh, the sort of uh, the secret of uh, success in its past 70 years. So this is the basis and foundation of the discursive framework of, um, of the Chinese Communist Party. How many minutes do I have? Two. Two, okay. Good. So then probably we can skip the... Let me talk uh, uh, just two sentences about uh, one country, two systems. So we just talked about that the Chinese body politic or the party state is a learning regime. Uh, the most important task for the party state as it's, uh, it recognized by itself is uh, learning. So I think the uh, one country, two systems, if we look at, if we see the one country, two systems from a larger scale, from a, from a historical perspective, we can see that this is not a temporary measure to just solve the sovereignty issue of Hong Kong, but more importantly, it's part of a, a bigger experimentation, a bigger learning process for the party state. It's a learning process for the Communist Party uh, to uh, manage at once a socialist economy and um, uh, uh, a capitalist economy. And also it's an uh, occasion for the Communist Party to learn how to peacefully coexist uh, or govern a sort of uh, a region in the country that has a totally different economic, social, and political system, even uh, social values, a totally different set of social values. And also the one country, two systems is a, is a learning process for the party state to learn how to manage uh, international, metropolitan, mu uh, multicultural city. This is so important because as I, uh, when, I was, uh, when, when I was in Beijing uh, uh, on Oct October the 1st, when I talked to people there, they all think that uh, um, Hong Kong, the, uh, today's Hong Kong will become the metropolitan landscape will become the future for many Chinese cities and the problems will be emerging in Chinese cities as well. So in a way, the Chinese uh, party state uh, facing the grave situation in Hong Kong, uh, their basic measure or their basic policy is to learn. Uh, it's not non-action, but to learn, to observe the situation carefully and to uh, learn different kinds of uh, actions, behaviors, ideologies, and uh, um, all kinds of things emerging from the protesting thing. And also they are learning from, uh, 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 they're observing and learning from the interaction, the unique form and the unique occasion of interaction between the state and society in Hong Kong. So I think, uh, in my view, this is a very good opportunity for the party state to, to learn how to manage 
uh, a metropolitan international city, and also how to uh, properly respond to issues and problems that might emerge in China some way uh, in the future. So to conclude, I think um, the, Ch the Chinese state today uh, is 70 years old. Some say that the real life starts at 70. At 70, you are relieved from burden of the past. The external order has been internalized into your moral core, and therefore, you have absolute freedom of action. As the rules have become part of yourself and, uh, um, and norms have become habitual. At 70, you ought to be more confident and no longer look elsewhere for guidance. Your heart is your gui guide, and you are the master of your body and mind. A great country is just like that. At 70, you calmly face what you have achieved in the past and focus on what you ought to do in the future. At the end of the day, your life will live on in the consistent and persistent endeavors of the generations to come, who perhaps today already share your belief in and responsibility for a better country, for, for, for a better future of a country on the road of um, national rejuvenation. Thank you so much. We'll have time for questions, and um, when there's microphones that will come around, if you could identify yourself and your affiliation uh, when you ask a question, please. Um, yeah, right here. Hi, I'm To Han Shi, a Singapore freelance journalist. On the National Day Parade on Tuesday, uh, the current Chinese president and two former Chinese presidents all stood together on a rostrum, and uh, the, the, the big, all three portraits of the three Chinese presidents were paraded in a military parade. What are the implications for this for the Chinese government going forward, and also for the way China will handle the Hong Kong protests? Thank you very much. I think, um, yeah, I was there attending the parade. I, I, I think the most, um, as I was told by other people in the audience, <laughs> that the most important thing is the nuclear missiles and so on. So I think this is a, basically a show, uh, thank you, a show of China's uh, innovative technology in defense, and also it is a show of China's ability of defend itself. Uh, in case of uh, uh, the foreign invasion. I don't think the military parade is, has a target, as a specific target, or, um, or targeting in Hong Kong or, some, uh, 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 or uh, in any way. Uh, of course, the basic law of Hong Kong s uh, specifies the situation in which, the occasion in which um, the Chinese state might uh, use military force to intervene in large-scale social unrest. And I think the Chinese state is very prepared for that. However, uh, at the moment, I, I, I believe some of the friends here will have the same questions that I have a longer answer. I, I, I think uh, for now, there's a very, uh, the possibility of uh, Chinese intervention, especially military intervention, is quite low. Um, there are several reasons. One is that the, uh, the, the bill, the fugitive bill itself, is, uh, completely belongs to uh, the uh, autonomy of Hong Kong. It's a decision made by the chief executive of Hong Kong, and it's, deal, it's de de dealt with by the chief executive and the Hong Kong government. So uh, there's, uh, it's not uh, something that touches upon the bottom line of uh, national security or the integrity of the Chinese uh, sort of uh, uh, territory. So uh, I don't think there's a very strong uh, foundation for a military uh, intervention. The second thing is that the Hong Kong police force uh, up to today are still e effectively uh, manages uh, managing the crisis. So I think they, and also they have uh, additional uh, uh, policy instruments to use uh, in terms of dealing with the situation. So there's not a practical necessity for the Chinese government to intervene. And also, thirdly, I think the Chinese uh, top leadership wanted to show to the Hong Kong society that they are really serious about one country, 
two systems. Even in this kind of very grave situation of uh, protest, the Chinese Communist Party wanted to leave this, wanted to leave this to the Hong Kong government to deal with. So uh, any sort of uh, intervention at this moment, at this stage, will be a compromise of the one country, two systems, especially the boundary between the two systems. So, um, but of course, we should not exclude the possibility of, a, of a possible escalation of the situation, at which point I think the, uh, uh, the Chinese government will re-evaluate the situation and make the necessary decision. Thank you. I, can you repeat your questions? Is that the question? Is a yeah. Is this a show of unity among the three Chinese presidents that they're shown together? Does this mean that Xi Jinping will, you know, take into account the views of Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin when he governs China in the future? Uh, I think the party's uh, uh, unity is always something the party wanted to show uh, to the country and to the world. And as far as I know, the, uh, the, the, the leadership today has a, um, has a fine relationship with uh, previous leaders, leaders. And so I, I, I think there should not be any problem in terms of this kind of uh, uh, inner party unity, in my view. I didn't, I, I didn't see any sort of a disunity here. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? When, there's one over here. Yeah. Please identify yourself. Hi, Edith Terry. I'm a, a Hong Kong-based writer. Um, I think that many of us looking at uh, the Hong Kong government's attempts to manage uh, the protest situation would say they have woefully mismanaged on many, many different levels. Goldman Sachs came out with a note today saying that there's been uh, between three and four billion uh, US dollars worth of outflow from Hong Kong to Singapore. Uh, my question is, um, Carrie Lam has been in uh, Beijing for the last few days. What is her ask? What should she, uh, w there's been this uh, di dialogue about her having to ask permission from Beijing to withdraw the extradition bill, whether or not it was uh, authorized by them in the first place. But now there's a whole series of things that need to be done in Hong Kong to de-escalate. And is she going to have to ask permission each time? How does this play out? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, from my observation, from my personal uh, observation, I think the uh, chief executive who, who is also in Beijing on October the 1st, uh, for the morning parade. I think she has uh, full power in terms of dealing with uh, the situation here in Hong Kong. Um, but she has constraints in terms of what kind of policy uh, she, or policy instrument she can choose to use. Uh, as um, I wrote in an article, in a Chinese article published in Minpao in 2017, that uh, any decision, any political decision made uh, in terms of Hong Kong affairs have to be acceptable um, by all three parties. These three parties, including the central people's government, the Hong Kong society, and the international community. So I think uh, if, and this is uh, a very famous uh, speech made by the late Deng Xiaoping on the day uh, the Sino-British uh, uh, Sino uh, joint declaration was signed in Beijing. So immediately after that, uh, Deng Xiaoping ha, uh, uh, sort of delivered a speech in which he said that any decision uh, related to Hong Kong must be acceptable to all three parties, the Central People's Government, the Hong Kong Society, and the international community. So I think when the chief executive is trying to make decisions, she has to uh, stick to that principle. And uh, so I think sometimes it's a very difficult uh, process of uh, deliberating on different kinds of options and uh, make a final decision. So in a way, uh, we sense that the decisions might be slow. Sometimes change is not timely. 
but uh, uh, I think this is the necessary uh, cost of balancing uh, the interests from all three parties, the central government, Hong Kong society, and uh, the international community. Okay, um, we have time for another uh, two questions. Yes, right here. Hi, Gillian uh, Hamilton. Uh, my, my question is uh, quite simple. You, you've mentioned that the, the, the party leadership in particular is, is a learning body, that it always learned from past experiences. Um, I guess my question is, what do you feel uh, Xi Jinping has learned from uh, the previous leaderships under Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin? And how, are, how is he going to apply it in uh, modern Chinese society? Um, that's a very good question. I would not, probably I will answer the question from a different pers perspective, but the same question, is that what uh, Xi Jinping learns from uh, the, uh, the, the years of uh, uh, Chinese development in, uh, since 1978. I think the most important lesson um, she learned is that um, China needs a strong leadership. Um, during the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao era, we can see that uh, as, uh, um, the um, uh, top leaders of the Communist Party themselves say that uh, the orders, uh, uh, political orders made by the Central Committee may not cross the wall of Zhongnanhai, the compound of the Central Committee, Zhenning Bu Chu So this is something uh, greatly, is a, is a very grave question for uh, issue for the Communist Party. Uh, in the 10 years of Hu administration that uh, uh, the implementation of political decisions has become a serious problem. So I think the central leadership, uh, the central committee needs a strong leadership who can make decisions and who can have the decisions enforced at the grassroots. I think it's the most important lesson uh, the Xi leadership learns uh, from uh, the past. And also, the second thing I think that she uh, leadership learns is uh, the importance of um, of a clean uh, leadership um, elites, uh, because in the past uh, 20 years before uh, 2012, we can see that uh, the corruption across uh, China and all over the Communist Party had become so grave that uh, even in the military, uh, the sort of uh, the uh, uh, people are selling right positions. And this has made uh, a huge issue. Uh, we know that in the Wenchuan earthquake, in the rescue uh, efforts afterwards, uh, the, 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 the party central committee uh, probably has no authority over the military. They have uh, these uh, joint efforts in terms of the rescue. So I think this is a lesson learned by the Xi leadership that uh, they have to have a clean clean, very clean government in order to have their de decisions properly enforced. And last but not least, I think it's the control over the military. That is the backbone of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, can clearly see that uh, the uh, President Hu might have problem in that regard as well. So, uh, so that is why uh, I think there's an effort in streamlining the military structure to tighten the control over military, uh, the, the, the PLA generals. So I think this is, these are all things that uh, the Xi leadership learns from the past. I think they work quite well, in a way, yeah. Okay, one last question. Yes, in the back. Thank you, Professor. My name is John Antweiler. I'm a retired banker, um, and I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. I have, um, a question that relates to a recent article in The Economist magazine relating to the, the celebrations for the October 1st um, anniversary. And that was that China has really not really focused so much on the failures of the past. The Great Leap Forward, the Red Guard, uh, you know, the deaths of millions, but has been focusing just on the future without regard to the failures of the past. And I'm just wondering if you could respond to, respond to that, that kind of thought. Thank you for the question. 
Um, I just mentioned to Madam President that I was in uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, I was in Boston to attend the memor memorial service of my late advisor at Harvard, uh, Professor Mac Farquhar, um, who did extensive research on the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And he had a very famous saying that the Cultural Revolution is the watershed in Chinese politics. Uh, why he said that? I asked him uh, before, and uh, I remember that he told me that because the Cultural Revolution and also the events before that, that Great Leap Forward and, thing, and so on, uh, these things show the darkest side of mis mismanagement of the country and of the economy. So I think both the top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, generations of top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, as well as the intelligentsia, the people, um, are all learning from the past of China. And that's a major dynamics, actually, for the reform and open up uh, policy in, uh, uh, in, the 97, in the 1980s, 90s, and all through in the 21st century. So I think the party actually learns a lot from the past. And historical memory cannot be eliminated uh, from, uh, from, from the people. That's uh, something we all know. But historical lessons will be reflected in the current policies. So I think every policy, the, every decision the top leadership is making today reflects their uh, memory of the past and also their learning of the past, as we can see the, um, the policies where the decisions the central government is making towards the Hong Kong situation here, I believe they learned from 1989 as well. So uh, learning is a continuing process and also it's a, pro it's a daily process that people are learning. It's not necessarily has to show in the uh, Tam in Tiananmen Square or in a parade, but I think it's more effective way of remembering the past is to remember the lessons from the past when you make decisions for today. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Yang. We have FCC gifts. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we will see you at the next luncheon. Thanks again.